So today's video I'll be showing you how the shading assist feature of Clip Studio Paint can help you with your colorization. This feature predicts where the shadow should be depending on where you place your lighting within the canvas. So before this feature can help us with our work, we should at least try to understand how the feature works. Let us start with a simple shape, a sphere, a cube, and a cone with a line art. You can put all the layers in a single folder and Shading Assist can still detect all the layers within the folder as one single layer. To add a Shading Assist, drop down the Edit in the menu bar, then find Shading Assist. Or, since there isn't a shortcut for this feature, we could do some workaround for an efficient workflow. While you are on the application, click the layer you want to add the Shading Assist, then press Alt which underlines some letters on the menu bar, that means those underlined letters are the shortcut for that specific option. Then press E to drop down the edits. And you'll notice that on the shading assist, there's a letter F inside the bracket that is being underlined, which would be the shortcut for the shading assist. So in quick action, select the layer, then press Alt, then E, then F, and it will spawn the shading assist window. But if you really wanted to add a shortcut to it, you can do that in your free time by going to File, Shortcut Settings, then change the category to Menu Commands. Now in the Shading Assist window, you can choose a different type of light source, whether it's a directional lighting or a ball of light. In a ball of light, the distribution of the shadow will be unequal, depending on the diameter of the light while the directional light source has equal distribution to all distances. As you can see, it's ignoring the line art completely and went only to the base color by default. So therefore, with or without line art, it will create the same prediction. So the prediction will be based completely on the base color shape and cannot read a 3D space. Even if it has an empty space between them, it would still do the same prediction, but if it has a huge gap between each color, it will now consider them as different objects. But if you add a different shade on the sides, the program will see this as a different object since it has a different base color and wouldn't read this as 3D space. Now if you check this box called refer to lines on reference layer, it would make the line art as a separator. But make sure you've set your line art as a reference layer or else you won't be able to check the box. Now we understand something about how this feature works. We can now adjust how we want the shadow to be by adjusting the settings. If you check the reverse shadows, the program will attempt to predict as if the light was from behind the objects. Now you could also adjust how thick or thin the midtones would be. And since this feature uses some common blending tools of the application, it is easier to understand and changing its color isn't really that confusing. Having the freedom to control the color is very useful, especially when you want to have some realistic transition of skin tones such as changing the midtone to orange as if it would portray a subsurface scattering. You could also add a division of shading by dragging the slider. You'll be able to notice the division because it has different shading to it. You can do this up to 3 divisions. Two dividers should be enough, but adding another one can be useful to add a specular highlight. That would mean that the object would be glossy. You wouldn't see it right away unless you change the blending mode of level 1 into glow dodge and change its color. You could also set the shading value of each division by double clicking these numbers. The larger the number, the darker it will become, and the number of the left side should be larger than the right. Making them equal will basically turn both shadings into equal value. You could also change the shadow type into smooth shading, and since we will be doing some semi-realistic in this video, we should use this right? From how it looks, it still looks good, and it has different settings than cell shading for maximum control. And from here, it only requires a few adjustments to make it look right. But in my case, I may prefer the cell shading because it will be easier to check the possible errors of the shading. The feature is good, but it doesn't always give us the accurate result. And besides, we could still do something from cell shading to make it look smooth shaded. 
Now once you press OK after adjusting the settings, it will create 3 or 4 different layers based on what you set from the shading assist window. Now that we know the very basics of this feature, we could try this to our simple artwork here and see what we can do about it. I'll be keeping the line art layer in this drawing as it should be the guide for shading assist. You can still include line art in semi-realism as part of your style, but what I want to do here is to make a lineless paint. I wonder how much color assist can do about lineless art style. Since we want to do lineless painting, we should replace line art with ambient occlusion, since ambient occlusion is the only way to separate colors from each other and create depth between them. If you don't know what ambient occlusion is, think about your shadow, and there are very dark areas every corner, that's why we can tell that the space isn't flat. Real life doesn't have line art, and ambient occlusion is one way to tell that there's a corner within that area. Light can bounce everywhere but cannot reach every corner, and that corner is where the light is occluded, hence ambient occlusion. Adding ambient occlusion is simple, you're just gonna need to use lasso tool to select some areas you want it to darken, then use the edge of the soft brush to get the sharp and soft effect of the shadow. Now when we're going to apply the shading assist to this work, we can use the evening preset as our global light source and use directional lighting. Now adjust the settings accordingly. The color choice of this preset is actually good. They've used a color that would make the shadow look somehow bluish because of the light that the sky is being provided. For the crystal glow, we can just use this standard preset and then change the color and tonal value of the shadow. The tricky part is mixing the two lighting, but we're gonna figure that out later on. For now, let's fix the shadow first before we mix them together. To edit the shadow, you have to merge the two layers that have multiply blending modes to it. Once you merge them together, it will turn to a normal layer. Then you can just reapply the multiply mode. To repaint them but still uses the same color that it has, you can just use the eyedropper tool to pick the color but make sure to change the reference settings to the current layer. Now you can normally use brush and eraser but hide the tone one first because we can edit that later on. But also you can change the layer color to make it less confusing from one lighting to another. But also don't forget to clip the layer to the base color folder. To edit the lighting part, which is the tone 1, you can do the same thing but you should avoid this layer overlapping on the multiply layer. To do that, you can simply control click the thumbnail of the multiply layer so you could make a selection. Then invert the selection by pressing ctrl shift i so you'll be only painting on the other side. Now you can just repeat the process for the crystal glow. Now we're going to mix the both shadings. One light should be less than the other. So in this case, sunlight always appears as a stronger light. So we lessen the opacity of the crystal glow. But this would actually depend on you. Then for all the shadings, you're just gonna need to blur the edges using the blur tool with at least 60 intensity of the blur. At this point, you can just actually use Gaussian blur. But we want to keep some edges. That is why we're manually doing the blur. Now here you see that the shadow is pretty messy, but given time, we could still make the blurring more precise, but we're just gonna overpaint it anyway, so what you see now is enough. The last thing you're gonna need to do is to overpaint. The feature only gives you a rough idea of how the shading would look, then of course you still need to have better grasp on shading to make it look better. So far by the looks of it, it's already gave us something. You're just gonna need to readjust the value and add one layer on the top of everything, then overpaint things manually. Don't forget to reset the eyedropper tool when needed. The purpose of this feature is to help you start 
not entirely do all the work for you. To make it look very good is still on you. So that's it for today, thank you for watching this video and I hope you learned something. Please subscribe to this channel, that would be a very big help for me to grow and would inspire me to make more videos in the future. Thanks.